The fighting game is a genre of video game where characters go one-on-one -on -one or team-on-team -team depending upon the game you're playing, or a variation of the two, using their own unique moves, stellar defense, and other mechanics, and attempt to deplete their opponent's life bar until there is none left, indicating the foe does not have the energy to continue battling, declaring the player without a fully drained life bar the winner. Alright, there's your history lesson of the day. Fighting games are usually about the tools and moves of a character rather than the characters that we make fight. However, we tend to overlook that each one of these characters has their own identity that may draw us in over any mechanics in the game. Just like a story, these games usually have some compelling characters that we may not know so much about. So why not pit these characters against each other in a list of 10 starting with the main characters, aka the protagonist. For this video, I won't just look at moves, but also personality and backstory that we may overlook. Any characters that were in another video game series or story in general before being in a fighting game, such as characters in a crossover game, will not be considered for this list. I'll also only allow one entrant per franchise, so series with multiple protagonists will have to put some folks on the sideline. Now that that's out of the way, here's the top 10 fighting game protagonists. Number 10 is Akira Yuki of the Virtua Fighter series. Akira is a character that lost the tournament in the first game because he was so enthusiastic, so he made himself even more generic in future games because he didn't already look and act like another fighting game protagonist that may or may not be on this list, cough cough. In reality, there were plenty of other protagonists that I could have chosen with a personality for number 10, but I usually forget number 10 by the end of the video anyway. Number 9 is Ragna the Blood Edge from the Blaze Blue franchise. He takes the route of the broody bad boy main character type. And of course he takes on this personality because he calls himself the Grim Reaper, which is not a very bright and shiny name, to me anyway. At least he has a logical backstory that explains why he's this dark sort of hero that's too long for me to explain. And of course, as a Blaze Blue character, I must comment on his astral finish and how intense it is. I believe he uh, takes his opponent's soul with that scythe he's holding? Eh, keep that away from me. Number 8 is Terry Bogar from the Fatal Fury and King of Fighters franchises. However, he has a bigger lead role in Fatal Fury. His appearance and random use of American slang such as come on, come on, get my attention. His hat also never falls off when he's fighting. Magic hat. Terry's outfit is iconic not just to King of Fighter fans, but also to characters in other video games. I'm of course referring to Red from Pokemon. Is it a coincidence that they're both wearing the same hat and vest? They'd basically be the same character if Terry's hair wasn't so long and blonde. However, if they were both 8-bit... Whoa, who's that? I don't know, it could be anyone wearing a red hat and red vest, but there are at least two characters with that outfit. Mysterious. Number 7 is Siegfried from the Soul Calibur series. Siegfried is the swordsman to save everyone because he can wield the mighty Soul Calibur, which is the good blade to stop the evil blade called the Soul Edge. Look at him, he's ready to vanquish evil with that sword that creates ice or something. Since he's an honorable knight, there isn't much to say about him. However, what I will say is Siegfried is significantly better than the character that replaced him in Soul Calibur V as the protagonist, Patroclus. That character may be one of my least favorite characters. Maybe not least favorite, but look how arrogant he looks. He basically just goes around killing people in the story mode, saying he's getting rid of the malfested or evil possessed people. But spoiler alert, the people that he's killing aren't actually evil, and Patroclus kind of just thought they were evil because he's Patroclus and whatever he thinks is true. Great guy, huh? Also, he has a bobcat or something on his shoulder. It's kind of creepy. Number 6 is Dimitri Maxima from the Darkstalker series. Dimitri is not always seen as a protagonist because he looks evil and angry as hell. However, he doesn't exactly mean any harm unless you bother him or have blood or something like that. His anger, though, may be justified. He's just angry because he was exiled for a hundred years after losing a fight to his enemy Belial Aislin, the scary looking guy, and then when he returned for revenge on his enemy, his enemy was dead. But that actually sounds like a good deal. His enemy's dead, now he can take over for what he lost. Wrong. Now he has to deal with Belial's daughter, Morgan. You might know who she is even if you didn't know what Darkstalkers was or who Dimitri was, which gets to my point on why Dimitri's so angry. It wouldn't have been so much of a problem if Dimitri only had to share his lead role with his enemy Snotnose Kid. However, with Morgan in the picture, he basically gets no recognition despite his role in the series. I mean, in all promotional artwork, Dimitri is there in the front, but Morgan is clearly more noticeable and portrayed as THE main character. Not to mention, in most crossover games where there's limited Darkstalkers representatives, Morgan is THE representative of the Darkstalkers series. I could just imagine Capcom's marketing department speaking to Dimitri about Darkstalkers news. Hey Dimitri, in Marvel vs. Capcom 3 there's gonna be two other Darkstalkers representatives besides Morgan. Um, am I one of them? 
Uh, well, we thought it'd be better if players could play as the cat girl and the blue woman. The, but that doesn't make much sense. Don't worry though, because we'll have you as this meaningless virtual trading card and as a palette swap for one of the broken characters in the game. Well, I guess that's a trade-off. But don't feel down about that, because we have a great position for you on the artwork for Darkstalker's Resurrection, right here with your face nice and big at the top of the box. Yes! Right next to Morgan's bigger portrait in the center of the artwork. Eh, yeah. Oh, come on! Number 5 is Labyrinth from Persona 4 Arena. Now, I said I would exclude characters initially from series that were not fighters, but Labyrinth was introduced in the fighting game Persona 4 Arena and was never shown in the previous Persona games that were RPGs, so I think that justifies why she can be on the list. I also need to say, the story mode took me a week to complete, the full story mode. I thought it would just be a few hours. No! Gather around for an epic tale about Labrys' history and also characters from previous Persona games, but mostly Labrys' history, which is why I consider her the protagonist over other characters. Plus, she's on the box art! Ignore the other guy who was the protagonist in Persona 4, she's the main character! Also, I can't really call this a fighting game story mode because it didn't really have any fighting in Labrys' part. Literally, I just watched one and a half hours of still talking picture movie thing. I smiled, I learned, I thought about other people crying at the sad parts since they were a little too predictable for me. I even laughed at this reference to the movie Rush Hour. In all honesty, Labrys' story mode makes her a sympathetic and likable character. Her weapons of choice are a New Jersey accent and this tool I can assume is a Labrys. If her name was anything else but Labrys, I would probably call it an axe because I'm ignorant to Greek weaponry. Oh, and the axe is actually a Labrys that turns into a jetpack if she wins. That might have been useful during the match. She could have flown out of reach of her opponent and been a massive jerk, but the creators didn't hire me on the creative team for this game, so it never happened and it likely will never happen. Number 4 is Black Orchid from Killer Instinct, or just Orchid for short. She is a secret agent looking to wipe out the evil organization known as Ultra Attack. I really should just say she's an agent because there's nothing secret about a gaudy green jumpsuit. Well, initially it was a jumpsuit. She was redesigned in the 2013 version of K.I. to make herself look more modern. She shares her protagonist's duty with her brother, Jago, who's a monk and was separated at birth from her. At first glance, you might think, why didn't I choose Jago over Orchid? He looks pretty badass with that tattoo and that ninja mask. Well, his move says pretty generic, consisting of a fireball, a generic sure you I mean anti-air, and what's this? A kick that propels him forward? We haven't seen that before. Just kidding. Orchid is just a more interesting character with her spinning something kick. Oh, okay, maybe not that move. Uh, she has these uh, scream stick things. She can summon a fire cat that she pets sometimes. I got it. Of all the characters in Killer Instinct, she speaks the most, and that's incentive enough to put her this high on the list. Number three is Ryu from Street Fighter. Looks like I'm rebelling by putting the most iconic fighting game character at only number three. Ryu is the character that established fighting games as a main genre. He's the embodiment of the fighting game genre since his personality is bettering himself and becoming the best martial artist in the world. But what doesn't put him at number one is, at the end of the day, he's still a generic guy that is meant to be accessible to everyone, from beginners to experts. That being said, he still has other personality traits shown in the games and other forms of Street Fighter media. And even though I criticize how generic he is, he established the attacks that would be known as the norms of fighting him attacks that would be generic on anyone else. Look at what he brought us, the Shoryuken, the Tatsumaki, this kick that no one ever mentions, and the famous projectile fireball, the Hadouken. And a bigger Hadouken. And an even bigger Hadouken. And an evil Hadouken. And an eviler Hadouken. And I should mention that he does have an inner evil side that he is fighting against. However, even the uh, evil side is kind of generic. I mean, he's called Evil Ryu. They couldn't have done more than take his name and add the word evil in front of it. Part of Ryu's appeal is just how iconic he is, and in a way, how much of a blank slate he is, meaning we can impose our own personality on him rather than some personality the writers gave us, and make him look as powerful or ridiculous as we want. Still, no matter how tiny you make his head at the end of the day, there will be more characters in Street Fighter that I personally think make the story more interesting than Mr. Poster Boy here. Number two is Liu Kang from Mortal Kombat. Yes, contrary to popular belief, Liu Kang is the official main character of Mortal Kombat, more so than Scorpion or Sub-Zero. They're just on the cover of the game because they look cooler and everyone likes them better. Okay, that last part was an exaggeration, but people do tend to choose a palette swap ninja over Liu Kang. I think Liu Kang deserves to be this high up because Mortal Kombat has always put an emphasis on the storytelling element, even in the original game in 1991. 
Plus, the fact that the first live-action MK movie was not terrible helped show that Liu Kang was more than just a boring ripoff of Bruce Lee. And by boring, I mean, just look at him in the first game. Oh boy, black pants, what a design. At least they had a headband in the second game. Yahoo. Oh, and the tank top by the fourth? Pinnacle of fashion. I mentioned his character was inspired by Bruce Lee. However, of all the Bruce Lee-inspired characters in fighting games, Liu Kang is the only one to be the savior of the world. He can punch straight through the final boss of MK because who needs physics? Really, no fighting game needs physics. Although Ryu's moves are iconic, Liu Kang's are a bit more interesting in my opinion. With his flying kicks, dragon fire, and everyone's favorite physically impossible move, the bicycle kick. It's beautiful. Nothing can stop Liu Kang except the writers killing him off. But don't worry because he comes back as a zombie. What? Writers come here for a second. You can make Liu Kang turn into a dragon. That's fine. You can make him summon an arcade cabinet. Please, I'd welcome that. But when he's resurrected as a zombie when literally everyone else in the series usually just comes back from the dead good as new, I think there might be a problem. Of course, I think the writers also found that to be problematic because they did reboot the series and we will never speak of this again. And they will hopefully avoid going overboard. Please? I hope. For number one, I wanted a character that represents his or her game beyond just being a hero or your run-in-the-mill anti-hero. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to go for a character struggling with good or evil or a character that's just a good person. I may have not chosen wisely, partly because Nina Williams isn't enough of a protagonist for me to include on this list, but to me, number one is Kazuya Mishima from Tekken. As opposed to many of the other protagonists on this list, Kazuya is a character that's more difficult to play. Some protagonist you are, I just want to sit here and throw fireballs all day. Kazuya goes from being a hero, to anti-hero, to sympathetic evil, to freaking evil, to... Eh, I'm theoretically evil, but I'll just let everyone do their own thing while I stand here, run a business, and be on the box art of Tekken 6. While he starts off as a typical hero that doesn't do anything evil, he says screw it and does the opposite of what I just said. Unlike other good guys that decide to avoid a path of corruption, he goes along with it. From here, he gains corrupt powers that we see protagonists fall victim to in various scenarios. And I'm not just talking about video games, I also mean TV, movies, and even possibly real life. Dun dun dun. And by that I'm not talking about anything supernatural or related to any fighting games, I'm talking about taking control of his father's company and becoming a CEO power in terms of authority over hundreds of people. And of course he still has his martial arts skills, so he has both physical power and figurative power. Plus look at that formal attire, purple button up with a vest? I'm practically losing money on negotiating with this man. Sure the red eye may be a little unsettling, but I can get over that. Some people I've spoken to tend to forget about Kazuya's role in the series, and really only remember the other protagonist of the series, Jin, who's Kazuya's son. The reason I've deduced why Kazuya's not as memorable as Jin is because Kazuya missed one Tekken game, and that game was Tekken 3, the most popular Tekken game ever, according to everyone on the internet, where Jin took center stage as the protagonist. Of all the games to miss, the cooler character has to miss the best one. That's like... like, uh... I don't have an analogy since it would take too long to set up and explain. Anyway, that's why Kazuya is my top fighting game protagonist, despite how much more time he spends being an antagonist. However, he's not my favorite fighting game character. Not by a long shot. However, that's a list for another day. Which fighting game protagonist do you like the most? Let me know. Thank you all for watching, and I will see everyone next time.